Well, good evening, everyone. Yes, tonight we are talking about parenting, and I have learned a number of very useful parenting hacks over the years. Everything from using pacifier clips on teethers so you don't lose them all at the grocery store, or using pizza cutters to cut up things like pancakes, waffles, grilled cheese. Yep, not just for pizza. Um, or Laura Ellingson, thank you very much for this tip. We put two layers of bedding on all of our infant and toddler cribs. Hello, little miss. Um, <laughs> uh, so that if they happen to blow out in the middle of the night, I'm not messing with elastic corners in a dimly lit room while I'm very tired. So that's been very helpful. I can just take off the top layer. There's another one ready to go. Um, or things like communication tools. There's a lot of things that I learned from my senior project on early childhood development or from working in the daycare, things like saying when and how before what, like we're going to stop and look both ways before we cross the street. Or um, there's positive ways to communicate things instead of the negative, like put your hands up instead of don't touch. Or being careful to encourage as often as you rebuke. I want to thank my kids for listening and good behavior as often as I correct them um, for times when they're misbehaving. These things are very helpful and even life-changing in some ways, but these kinds of parenting tips are very limited. You see, you can sleep train your infant, you can feed your toddler all super nutritious organic food, you can pursue the perfect education for your student, you can put your athlete on the best traveling team, but none of these things get at, what the, get at the heart of what God has called you to do for your children. We need to be more concerned with the spiritual growth of our children than we are with their physical health, their mental stimulation, their acquired skills, even good morals. The only thing that will affect eternity is the spiritual growth of your child. Yes, we want our children to believe in God and we want them to go to church and to do what is right, but too often the primary focus of our parental energy is on producing well-behaved children. But when the focus is on controlling behaviors, we are not focusing on their spiritual growth. Your kids were made for God. They weren't just made for a good education, a good job, a good house, a good marriage, or good citizenship. These things have value, but they are not why your children were given breath, and they must not be our ultimate goals as parents. Our children were made to find life, hope, identity, and meaning in God. So tonight I pray that God can speak to us about the ways that he plans to use us to encourage spiritual growth in our children. Let's start out by taking a look at one of the most famous passages in the Bible, the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to start in verses 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. What follows in verses 6 through 9 is one of the most famous passages concerning parenting. We can glean insight for parenting from all over the Bible, but this passage is very specific. In, in verse 6, it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Skipping down to verse 20, the chapter closes with this passage. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws that the Lord our God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all the laws of the Lord our God that he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. This passage reminds us that we need to talk about the big God story with our children. God's hand working throughout history to have relationship with your children. We often hear and teach segmented stories of our faith where David is the hero one day, Moses is the focus another, and Jesus is simply another character. We can help our children to connect the dots by telling them that Jesus is part of every story. It is part of our job as parents to communicate that big God story in as many ways as we can every day. So what is this big God story? Well, let's take a look. 
And now, uh, through the magic of a popsicle stick of puppetry, uh, we bring you the story of everything. Everything? Pretty much. God, the man, the world. It's a genesis, man. It's the beginning of everything. Okay, let's hear it. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away... I think you're telling the wrong story. What? Oh, uh, you're right. <laughs> Here we go. A long time ago, right about that... Uh, here, uh, there was God. God is a cloud? It makes about as much sense as showing him as an old man with whiskers. I see your point. The Bible says God is love, but when we tried to show him as a heart, he just looked like a valentine. Mm, too hallmark. Right. He appeared to the Israelites as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The fire thing was a little scary. So we decided to go with the cloud. I think we made the right choice. I couldn't agree more. And we're calling him he, not because God is a boy, but because the Bible calls him he. Both men and women came from God, so he isn't one or the other. You know, this show can only be so long. Right, uh, sorry. On with the story. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. No planets, no stars, no trees, no iguanas, no toaster ovens, no kids, no eyeglasses. Chester. Nothing, just God. And then he created, he spoke, and the universe came into being. He must have had a loud voice because it made a big bang. <laughs> Get it? A big bang? <laughs> That's an astrophysical joke. Anyway, the earth was formed and cooled and water appeared. Then God caused the plants and the fish and animals to pop up. And then he said, watch what I'm going to do next. This is going to be great. And boom, he made a man and a woman. They didn't have any clothes, so they had to stand behind the bushes whenever anyone took their picture. What? You know, for kids' Bibles and stuff. And the creation was a done. God put Adam and Eve in a wonderful garden with everything they could want. And he gave them this uh, free will. That's right. But to really have free will, they needed to have a choice to make. So he put a tree in the garden and said that if they loved him and trusted him, they shouldn't eat from that tree or even touch it. Right. Here's the tree. Don't touch the tree. It's a no good. Just one tree? In the whole garden, just one tree they couldn't touch? How odd could that be? Well, it got harder when someone else showed up in the garden. Who showed up? Santa Claus? Elvis? Sure, why not? Santa Claus and Elvis! Chester! Sorry, I uh, know. It was a serpent. You mean, like a snake? Right, uh, like a snake. But this wasn't an ordinary snake. This snake was evil. He told Eve that God was wrong, that eating from that special tree would make them as wise as God himself. Now Adam and Eve had a choice to make. Would they trust the God, or would they trust the snake? Don't trust the snake! Don't trust the snake! Oh, I've got a bad feeling about him. This is where that free will comes into play. God let Adam and Eve choose who to trust. They chose the snake. And now... All right, so that story leaves off where Adam and Eve had chosen to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now they are made aware of their sin. And sin continues to fill the world for generations. And a little down the road, we find the people of Israel. So let's take a look at them. There were grannies, granddads, babies, uncles, aunts, children, moms, and dads out there in the middle of the desert. They had blisters from all the walking. They were hungry and thirsty and much, much too hot. We don't like it, they said. It stinks. And so they did, for that matter, because none of them had taken a bath in weeks. Now remember, because this is something they'd forgotten, God had done something amazing for his people. He'd hidden them inside a cloud. He'd moved the sea. He'd set them free. But God's people still weren't happy. They didn't care about being free. Wasn't it better when they were slaves? At least they had had lots of nice food to eat. God doesn't want us to be happy, they said. It was the same lie that Adam and Eve had heard all those years before. God has brought us out here to kill us. God doesn't love us. But they didn't know God very well, did they? Every day of their journey, God kept on showing his people how he would look after them if they would trust him and obey him. When they were hungry, God made the sky rain with food, bread coming down from heaven. What is it, they asked each other. They didn't know, so they called it, what is it? Which, of course, is a very good name for something when you don't know what it is. 
And when they were thirsty and started quarreling, God made water from a rock. Moses called that place quarreling because they seemed, that seemed like a good name too. And still God's children didn't trust him or do what he said. They thought they could do a better job looking after themselves and making themselves happy. But God knew there was no such thing as happiness without him, so God led them to a tall mountain. God wanted to talk to his people and show them what he was like. He wanted to help them know him better and tell them about the special land he was going to give them. The whole earth belongs to me, God said, but I have chosen you. You are my special family. I want you to live in ways that shows everyone else what I am like, so they can know me too. God called Moses up the mountain to a the great mountain shook. A thick cloud fell, thunder roared, the lightning cracked, and God gave Moses ten rules called commandments. I want you to love me more than anything else in the world and know that I love you too. God told them that's the most important thing of all. God gave them other rules like don't make yourselves pretend gods, don't kill people or steal or lie. These rules showed God's people how to live and how to be close to him and how to be happy. They showed how life worked best. God promises to always look after you, Moses said. Will you love him and keep these rules? We can do it. Yes, we promise. But they were wrong. They couldn't do it. No matter how hard they tried, they could never keep God's rules all the time. God knew they couldn't, and he wanted them to know it too. Only one person could keep all the rules, and many years later, God would send him to stand in their place and be perfect for them because the rules couldn't save them. Only God could save them. And so this is the Bible's depiction of the human condition. So sometimes we pull off amazingly good stuff, but just as often, despite our best intentions, we act selfishly and we create evil in the world. And so we're stuck as mediocre rulers making a mess of things. But that's not the end of the story. So the Bible goes on and it makes this claim that all of this was resolved when God bound himself to humanity through Jesus. And he showed us what it looks like to truly rule as a human. So what does it look like? Well, Jesus ruled by serving and by seeking the best for others, by putting himself underneath them and loving not just his friends, but also his enemies. And that's not a typical way to rule. And not only that, Jesus confronted the consequences of all of the evil and the death that we have created by our messed up ways of ruling. And he takes it. I mean, he lets it kill him. And so when the New Testament writers looked back to Jesus' resurrection, they see a whole new future opening up for all humanity. Jesus is a new way to be human. Yeah, that's why they called Jesus the image of God or the new human. And not only that, they also believe that Jesus' divine life and power is now available to heal and to transform us to become our life and power. And this sounds really nice, but what does it really look like? So practically, the Apostle Paul said it looks like people being filled by Jesus' own presence and spirit, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and integrity and gentleness and self-control. He says this is the new humanity that God wants to create in us so that we become people in whom God's image is being restored, people who will move the human project forward. And that's actually how the story of the Bible ends. It's a renewed world where God is on his throne and his servants are all around him, but they're the ones ruling over this new world, taking it into new uncharted territory with Jesus as their healer and their guide. And so this there are some awesome resources available for us to help tell our kids this big God story. If you have not already gotten access to Right Now Media, get it. All you have to do is contact the church office. They will send you an invite, and you will have access to hundreds of resources on their website or downloading their app. The first clip that we watched was from What's in the Bible by Phil Vischer. Um, and this, the entire series can be found on Right Now Media for free. It's super educational and super fun. I promise you will laugh and learn watching alongside of your elementary-aged children. The story that we read about the God's law was from the Jesus Storybook Bible, which is a favorite in our household for reading to our littles because it does a great job not only of teaching so many of um, the beloved biblical stories that kids learn while they're growing up, but connecting all of them into one big story and always pointing to Jesus. And the last clip that we watched was part of the Heaven and Earth clip 
um, by the Bible Project and Tim Mackey. Um, and a lot of his videos can be found on Right Now Media as well as on their website, thebibleproject.com, where you can also download additional resources. They have videos that walk through each book of the Bible um, that you can watch and then read through the Bible. You can download their Read Scripture app, and it maps it all out for you. Um, so those are an awesome way to work through the Bible with your middle and high school kiddos. Teaching our children about God and his role in history is vital. Starting with creation, each of our children were created in the image of God, and they deserve to be treated with respect, not because they've done anything to earn it, but because they are made in the image of God. And God was enjoying fellowship with Adam and Eve in the garden until sin entered the picture, and sin broke their relationship with God. God was determined to restore that relationship, and so he singled out the people of Israel, and he gave them rules. These rules were meant to provide a way for the Israelites to have a relationship with God and to reflect God and his character to the nations around them. It is important that we share God's law with our children. No human being, including your child, was created to be self-governing. So God in his mercy gave us his law so that our behavior would be guided by a clear knowledge of right and wrong. Your children would have no understanding that they are sinners in needs of God's grace if it was not for the law. The law works as a standard for us to measure our hearts against and see just how short we fall of being holy enough to be in the presence of a holy God. But the law is not enough. Knowing that we fall short is not enough. The problem was that the Israelites were terrible at keeping these rules. They had a fundamental problem, a problem of the heart. And God clearly addresses this problem when he addresses the Israelites in Ezekiel 36 Verse 26, moreover, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Stone is hard and because it is hard, it is resistant to change, but flesh is soft and because it is soft, it is moldable and capable of change. Jesus came so that our hearts would be new and renewing so that he could change us from the inside out. This is what God wants for each of our children. He wants to give them a new heart. He wants to save them from themselves. The greatest danger to your kids is not the world around them. It is the sin inside of them. The law is a blessing, but we cannot ask the law to do what only God can do in the hearts of our children. The most powerful force of transformation is God's grace. It will do what rules and regulations can never do in the heart of your child. If rules and regulations could produce a heart that is willing to submit to God and do what is right, then Jesus never would have needed to come. Which leads us to the next part of the big God story. Jesus, God sent Jesus to earth to be a physical example of the Teshema, to show us what it is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. But this is not all he came to do. He made a way for our sin to be forgiven, even though we do not deserve it. This is grace. And when he returned to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell among us. This is grace. The same grace that is extended to us is what God asks us to extend to our children. Grace never calls wrong right, or there would never be a need for grace. Instead, grace moves towards a disobedient child with love, tenderness, hope, forgiveness, wisdom, and guidance. We have no ability to change our children, or again, the person of Jesus would not have been necessary. So what is our role? Changing a child's heart is God's job. He just asks you to be a tool in his capable hands. There was a time recently when Sam and Paisley were playing. Sam became frustrated and hit his sister. I was busy working on my to-do list, and the temptation was to holler, Sam, don't hit your sister again. But instead, I chose to engage in a two-way conversation. I asked Sam, when you hit your sister, are you showing her you love her? His response, I don't love her. I know he does, but I chose not to engage him in that direction. I simply asked him, who made her? He, of course, replied, God. And I was able to talk to him about when he works hard on making a picture, what he's proud of. Does he want his sister to come over and scribble on it or tear it? 
No, he wants her to be respectful and appreciate his art. In the same way, God wants us to respect the people that he made and show them love. I trust that as I take the time to engage in conversations like this throughout our days, that the Holy Spirit will be at work in his heart. Every conversation is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of your children. As a parent, you are not dealing with bad behavior. You are dealing with a condition that causes bad behavior. The goal of parenting is not controlling behavior. It is heart change. If all you do is set up a system for controlling behavior, when your children leave your home, they have nothing. God has called you to something deeper than to control your child's behavior. God has called you to be an agent of his rescuing, forgiving, transforming, and delivering grace. We do not need to address the behavior as much as we address the thoughts, motives, and desires of the heart that actually control behavior. We need our children to understand that the biggest problem in life does not exist outside of them. It exists inside of them. The problem is the heart. It's never just about food, sleep, friends, Instagram, homework, clothes, uh, household rules, sibling squabbles. Those things are struggles because there is a deeper war going on inside the hearts of your children. Our children need parents who will do more than try to control their choices. They need parents who will seek to understand them at a heart level and be an instrument of heart change. Lasting change in the behavior of your child will always travel through the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Your children live out of their hearts. God will use you to reveal your child's heart to them. And each moment you expose your child's heart is a moment you are giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do things in and for your child that you could never do. So every day, look for opportunities to continue the conversation. And as you do, don't consider these moments where correction is needed as interruptions or hassles, but as gifts of grace given to you by a God who is at work in the hearts and lives of your children. When you discipline your child, you have a God-given opportunity to talk to them about their heart. Since it's true that behavior reveals the condition of a heart, misbehavior gives you a picture of what controls their heart, an opportunity to help the child see what is in his heart. And each time you do this, you are part of what God is seeking to do in the life of your child. And you are giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to impart personal conviction and a desire to change. In these moments, ask questions, tell stories, give illustrations, anything you can do to help your child see beyond themselves, to quit defending themselves, and to examine their heart. In this way, parenting is not just a series of confession-producing confrontations that result in immediate change. It is a lifelong process of incremental awareness of the heart and progressive change through Jesus Christ. Sanctification. Many, many moments of change. If your eyes ever see or your ears ever hear the sin and weakness of your children, it's never an accident, it's never a hassle, it's never an interruption, it's always grace. I want to be a tool in the life of my children to lead them to heart awareness. So what am I looking for and how do I address it? The Bible is full of insight on issues of the heart and the change that God wants to do within us. Let's start with authority. One of the foundational heart issues in the life of every child is authority. The fights over eating vegetables, when to go to bed, what to wear, what to watch, or the cleanliness of the child's room are not first about these issues. They are first about authority. Who will decide how I will live? Your children must learn early that they were born into a world of authority, and they're not it. People who are committed to self-rule won't submit to the rules of another. And because they won't submit to the rules of another, they won't confess their wrongs. And because they won't confess their wrongs, they um, won't seek God's forgiveness and help. 2 Corinthians 5.15 tells us that he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Teaching clear, consistent, biblical authority is part of why Jesus came and part of how he plans to use you in the lives of your children. God has made his invisible authority visible by sending visible authority figures as representatives. This means that every time you exercise authority in the lives of your children, it should be a beautiful picture of the authority of God. If you exercise authority in a lazy, abusive, selfish way, you will strengthen the natural rebellion of authority in the hearts of your children. 
What God has called you to is to daily show your children how beautiful, helpful, and patient God's authority is. When you see your children resisting authority, have a brief conversation that once again enables them to look at and understand the heart struggle behind their resistance. We need to teach children the beauty of authority so they can find joy in surrendering to the authorities that God has placed in their life and ultimately surrender their hearts to the authority of God. Another issue of the heart that the Bible addresses is character. Much of the wrong that your child does is a result of a lack of character. It is not enough to target direct disobedience on your children. You must have an eye on their character. It is not enough just to emphasize the beauty of submission to authority. You must also emphasize the need for character development. Their problem is that they lack character, and because they do, they haven't done what is right, good, loving, or kind. Like when they sit quietly watching TV instead of helping mom get dinner ready for company. Romans 1.25 says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. In this passage, the Bible connects character issues to worship. Everything your child does is worship. Will the heart of your child be controlled by love of the creator, worship, or love of the creation, idolatry? Often the character issues in the lives of your children exist not because they want bad things, but because they have become enslaved to good things. You see, a desire for even a good thing really does become a bad thing when it becomes a ruling thing. Like in the example of the kids watching TV while mom works in the kitchen. In that moment, they are worshiping comfort. Comfort is not altogether a bad thing, but when it becomes a ruling thing, it can prevent us from seeing the needs around us and the ways that God could use us to help someone else. Your children don't understand the connection between character and worship. It is your God-given job to make this connection for them. God is revealing to you what your children don't see and don't understand so that you can show it to them and the Holy Spirit can work conviction and confession into their hearts. Your children don't need character management as much as they need worship realignment. They have a worship problem that produces a character problem. And because of this, they don't they need more than character critique. They need to be given insights into the worship functions of their heart. Make the character worship connection again and again and again for them. Everything your child does is meant to be worship to God. When it is not, it is worship of something else. That is idolatry. When we give our hearts to the one true, we all give our hearts to the one true God or to some created replacement. The capacity of worship and the heart of your children is meant to drive them to God. But sin causes all of us to exchange the worship and service of the creator for worship and service of the creation. God will use the normal stuff of daily responsibilities, relationships, and temptations to reveal to you what is going on in the heart of the worshipers entrusted to your care. If you see wrong in the hearts of your children, but they do not acknowledge that wrong, they will resist your help, and they will not commit themselves to change. Parenting is not just about getting your child to do something, but helping them to see so that they would desire to do it. God can use us to help lead our children to this place of seeing and desiring change. He will use you to lead them to confession. In order to do so, we should respond to our children in ways that open their heart and give them eyes to see and a voice to confess. If you are not Christ-like in your responses to your children, you will shut down their hearts, make them angry and defensive, and they will want to escape you rather than hear you. Leading your children to confession is about having tender, patient, understanding, and insight-giving conversations with your children that are intended to get them to examine what they haven't acknowledged and begin to accept responsibility for the thoughts, desires, and choices that cause them to do what they do. We must remember that we have no ability at all to deliver our children from the natural idolatry of their hearts. Admitting our inability to do so is not giving up as a parent. On the contrary, this humble admission is where Christ-centered, heart-changing parenting grows. If you confess your inability, then you do not allow yourself to think that a louder voice, more graphic vocabulary, a bigger threat, a bigger reward, or shaming them is going to alter the worship content of your child's heart. Our role is to faithfully hold God's standard before our children, to lovingly confront their wrong choices, to work to help give them insight into their hearts, to be humbly honest about our own struggles, to talk to them again and again and again about the grace to be found in Jesus Christ, and to model his patience and forgiveness. 
After all, every moment you are parenting is a moment that you are being parented by your Heavenly Father. It is not a sign of personal weakness to feel unable as a parent. The reason you feel this is because it's true. God calls you to the impossible so that in your search for help, you would find Him. The kind of parenting we have talked about requires love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These character qualities are not a moral standard that God lays before you and waits for you to achieve them. They are moral gifts from a God of grace. Parents who know they need grace tend to want to give grace to children who are just like them. We can move towards a child as a sinner in need of grace confronting a sinner in need of grace. I am more like my children than unlike them. There are few struggles in the lives of my children that aren't in my life as well. Materialism, wanting my own way, attractions to the world, subtle idolatries. If you want to be God's tool of heart rescue and change in the lives of your children, you have to humbly start with your own heart. Otherwise, your heart will cause you to be in the way of what God is trying to do rather than be a willing part of it. The issues of the heart that we talked about, authority, character, worship, are our issues as well. What gets in the way of good parenting is often the character of the parent. If you deal with a lack of character, with a lack of character, you will not accomplish what God has called you to accomplish in the hearts of your children. When you are frustrated, mad, discouraged, unkind, abusive, bitter, joyless, vengeful, irritated as a parent, you don't so much need to be rescued from your children, you need to be rescued from you. Proper handling of character issues always begins not with a lecture, but with a confession. Before we have a conversation with our children, we need to have a conversation with the Lord. We need to confess that it is not just our children who lack character, we do as well. That's why there are moments when we are walking down the hallway towards one of our kids' rooms and we're actually angry because one of our children has the audacity in that moment to need parenting. When you confess that, what, um, that when it comes to character struggles, you are more like your children than unlike them, you deal with character problems with patience, kindness, and grace. Their worship struggles are your worship struggles as well. Like them, you let good things become bad things because you let them become ruling things. And when you admit this, you stop being self-righteously judgmental and start being compassionate. Worship team, would you go ahead and come as we prepare to close? But before we do, I want to leave you with a few encouraging words. Those of us parenting are doing so in the middle of our own sanctification. It's not just your children who are in a lifelong process of change. You are too. You are not yet all that God's grace has the power to help you to be. God hasn't just sent you to do his work in the lives of your children. He will use the lives of your children to advance his work in you. Parenting is hard. It will expose your weaknesses and it will challenge your faith. There are moments when you will lose control and there are moments that will seem out of control. But there is nothing, never a parenting moment that exists outside of the control of the one who called you. He is with you. He would never sit idly by as we give ourselves to the single hardest, most comprehensive, most long-term, most exhaustive, most life-shaping task that a human being could take on. No, when your father calls you, he goes with you. If you load all that your children need on your shoulders, you will be overburdened, overwhelmed, and discouraged. Remind yourself again and again and again that God is with you. He rules what you cannot rule, and he gives you what you cannot give yourself. In every moment when you are parenting, you are being parented. In every moment when you are called to give grace, you are being given grace. The more you confess your limits, the more you rest in his power, the more you will be able to be freed from the temptation to do in and for your child what only God can do. A humble parent will inevitably look back with some regret, but do not live in regret. Live in the grace that welcomes you to learn from the past. Confess your faults. Receive forgiveness. Lay down your burden of guilt and shame and move forward with new hope, courage, and joy to what God is calling you to in the parent right here and right now. Let's humbly come before the Lord. Let's spend some time allowing the Holy Spirit to expose our hearts to us to show us where our heart is standing in the way of what he wants to do in the lives of our children. I know his grace will meet us where we are and work to change our behavior.
starting with our heart. Jesus, thank you so much for sending the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of our children and to work in our lives. God, I pray that we would trust that what you have for our children is so much better than anything that this world could offer. God, I pray that we would trust that what you can do in and for our children is infinitely more valuable than anything that we could do for them and impart on our own. So God, as we rest in you, as we trust you, use us to further your work in the lives of our kids.